Well, we have had an overwhelming amount of questions this evening from our attendees. We really appreciate you submitting those beforehand as well as this evening. Um, due to some time constraints, we will not be able to address each question individually. Um, hopefully throughout the evening, we have been able to touch upon your questions and really support you um, in your goals for coming this evening. Um, we will, however, take some time to discuss some submitted questions with our panelists. So we will just take a moment um, so everyone can join and uh, we will start with our first question. Um, can you provide any additional information in terms of accessing clinical trials? And Dr. So Mary Porter, there are a number of, of <laughs> clinical trials available really across the country. Um, you know, I can speak to Hamilton in particular. There's a lot of unanswered questions. We've got some great, uh, we have some great drugs now, as you've heard from Dr. Aurora. She touched on some uh, areas that are, are going to be, I think, more in headline news in terms of giving immunotherapies before having surgery. Um, we don't have a study open in that sphere right now. Uh, but things that we are looking at are how long do people require uh, being on immunotherapy in the in the setting of stage four or metastatic melanoma? It's really an unanswered question. Uh, some some studies went up to two years. Some studies continued on indefinitely. And um, we do have that's a, a Canadian um, design study that's run through the uh, Canadian uh, Cancer Trialist Group. It's across the country. Uh, the study was designed uh, by some docs in Ontario, and we have it open, really looking at um, how much immunotherapy may be enough. Very important question. Uh, we have studies looking at other combinations. So again, Dr. Aurora spoke about the ipilimumab nivolumab combination, very effective, um, but a pretty significant serious side effect rate in the range of 60%. So we're looking at combining drugs like nivolumab with other targets, um, other types of drugs that will boost the immune system in the hopes of getting drugs that are, are as effective with perhaps a better side effect profile because quality of life is certainly uh, important. We want to uh, treat the cancer, but we want to keep our patients feeling well also. Even in the surgical sphere, there are certainly um, trials coming. We talked about these large, um, large wide local excisions and scars. And really some of the, the data behind how big do you need to make that incision is, is quite old and maybe not as rigorous. It just sort of came to be and stayed that way. So there are uh, there is a trial uh, in the works. It's already out and open in Australia. We're gonna partner with uh, Australia in Canada to open that study, looking at different um, sizes of margins for surgery. Um, so in terms of accessing um, clinical trials for all the folks that are have, have joined on this, would say ask your doctor, is there a trial that's right for you? Um, chances are that there, there may be. And there are not trials in the, in the setting of where patients are on uh, surveillance. So you've had your surgery, perhaps you've had treatment after your surgery, um, and you're seeing, as uh, Heather talked about, you're seeing your physicians, your oncologist and dermatologist regularly. But in terms of uh, potentially trials in the setting of post-operative, uh, another area where there's a study coming out uh, for patients who have high risk stage two cancer, stage two B and two C, we are gonna be looking at immu immunotherapy uh, in that setting. So um, I think there's a lot of optimism for patients that there's, um, uh, there's a, a lot of research being done. Uh, most of the cancer center websites will also have some information on um, on trials, really the best bet is, is talk to your doctor and the, or the melanoma network as well. They've got a fair bit of information on that. We keep them updated. Thank you so much. And this question is for both Margo and Heather. Um, there was a few wondering, how can I um, get others around me and my support systems to take skin cancer seriously? What are some tools or tips that you have used? Um, so for myself, you know, really I've just shared my experience. Um, I've 
been pretty safe in terms of sun exposure my whole life, but I have history. I have, uh, you know, I we, I was on the water a lot as a kid, so I do have a lot of um, risk factors, but I think I've just really just been sharing my story um, and just trying to explain that like some of this stuff is preventable. Thank you so much, Heather. Great, thanks, Heather. That's a great answer. And, you know, this is a question that I have gone over in my mind many times because um, it is really disheartening when people just dismiss the dangers. Um, I think, too, especially people who have melanoma, that your story, your experience is so powerful. Like, you are definitely the reality check. So if people aren't listening to what you have to say, then, you know, I think there's some pretty hardcore denial going on. And um, they might be a really tough sell. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're really just responsible for ourselves, not for changing other people. You know, that being said, you know, we still, I think, can be sun safety warriors and express our opinions and our feelings about this. Um, you know, sometimes I do things like um, I look at some of the great resources that Jane and Mary are always sending out and tweeting. And I might, you know, uh, email that to some people who are questioning, uh, who are doing lots of tanning and so on. And, um, you know, in the subject line, I might say, I'm just sending this along because I really care. And that might help to avoid that power struggle, which you never really want to get into, because that just ends up, you know, with bad feelings. Um, so I try not to give up. I try to carry on. And I think even though people may not change their behavior, I think they do start to realize or they decide they're not going to talk about tanning and things like that with me. And we kind of joke about it. People even say, oh, don't talk about tanning to Margo. You know, she's going to give you an earful. You know what? I just roll with it and say, yeah, that's right. <laughs> So um, I really appreciate all the information that MNC um, provides about this. And I think the organization has done a great job in some really good campaigns and getting the information out there and hopefully convincing people to take this to heart. Um, we've had some really good prevention awareness activities and campaigns, and I think it's with the generous donations and support that people give us allow that to happen. So we couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much. Um, and this is for Dr. Aurora. Uh, we had a question submitted. Why would an oncologist recommend one drug over the other? And how do I have that conversation with my oncologist? Yeah, that's a great question and um, <clears throat> I mean I think it comes down to a lot of different things so um, I mean as I talked about there's a lot of options for treatment um, so I mean the first question is you know what's the goal of treatment right are we talking about um, you know a metastatic um, patient or um, uh, you know a preventative uh, setting um, you know there's many things that I mentioned in my talk in terms of that ERAF mutation being very important um, and then there's other sort of factors to think about. So um, I didn't really get a chance to talk about side effects today, but um, the BRAF inhibitors can have their own set of side effects. Um, an important one is, you know, fevers and, and feeling a bit flu-like. And you can imagine at a time like this, the pandemic, um, no one's going to pass screening into the hospital if they're having, you know, fevers at home. So that's definitely been a consideration for us in terms of offering um, the BRAF inhibitors. And then just with immunotherapy, um, as I had mentioned, combination therapy has um, very high, um, relatively speaking, high chances of running into some troubles um, compared to just one um, agent alone. So that's a bit of a balance, I would say. And that really comes down to a discussion between the patient um, and their oncologist about, um, you know, can we um, balance the potential side effects uh, with the benefits of the treatment and it comes down to you know how fast is the melanoma growing where is the melanoma so for example um, unfortunately melanoma can go to the brain and um, there is some more benefit if a patient gets um, combination immunotherapy or if they get the BRAF inhibitors they can get more benefit um, in terms of the spots in the brain um, versus if they just got you know just a single agent uh, immunotherapy. So 
I mean, those are just a few things. There's definitely lots and lots of considerations. There are definitely complex um, decisions with lots to consider. Um, but I think, you know, having that discussion with um, your oncologist and, um, you know, being informed about all the, the possible options and just asking, you know, um, what's your rationale for this one? Um, what do you, why do you think it will benefit me? Um, I think that will go a long way just to, to educate um, yourselves about why you're getting the treatment you're getting. Thank you so much. And we have time for one last question, and this is for Dr. Porter. Um, there were a number of attendees wondering about um, anything to help support with the prevention of a reoccurrence. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And touched on the fact that patients who have had one melanoma are at a greater risk of a second melanoma. So not related to a cell escaping from that first melanoma, but a whole new mole on the skin related again to risk factors, many of which were when people were young in terms of burn and burns and sun exposure. So um, certainly practicing sun safety is key. Uh, other things, there is not great data in terms of any particular um, diets or lifestyle changes, but certainly, um, you know, practicing healthy eating habits, uh, exercising, uh, keeping in mind, paying attention to your mental health as well are all very important. Um, you know, even to touch on the mental health bit, we know that there's a, a there's certainly a communication between brain and body, um, and high periods of stress can elevate your cortisol levels, which are stressful on the body. So I do really think that. Um, paying attention to your, your um, mental health as you deal with your journey through cancer from diagnosis to surgery to Heather's position of being in a, a close surveillance is very important.